Uh, you guys ready to get into the scriptures? All right, Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15. Thank you so much, Marcy. I know that was a lot of playing. Um, Luke chapter 15. Yeah, go ahead. Give it up for Marcy. She loves the attention. <laughs> Not really. Um, so we're in this series entitled Finding Your Way Back to God. So here's what's been happening. If you've been gone or out of town and traveling, that kind of thing, um, we, we're, we're looking at the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, one translation calls it the parable of the lost son. And so um, we've been looking at just this passage of Scripture. This is a five-week series for us. So this is week three. And so we're, most of the Scriptures that we're looking at and we're directing our attention to are found right there in this parable that Jesus told. Now, for some of you that are relatively new to coming back to church and, and coming back to the Lord and, and the Bible and stuff, uh, a parable is a story. And it's a story that Jesus told, and of course, the purpose of the story was, is to communicate a spiritual truth. And so the spiritual truth uh, that Jesus is trying to communicate here is um, he, he's communicating the idea of who our Heavenly Father is, all right? So what we've been looking at through this parable, the parable of, uh, the, parable of the prodigal son, is we're looking at five awakenings, five aha moments, five kind of turning points that this young man goes through in the process of finding his way back home. So what we discovered was that at the beginning of the parable, this young man asked for his inheritance early. Uh, his father gave it to him. The young man decided to take off and find himself out into a distant land. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and, and, and start in verse uh, verse 11 here, and let's go ahead and read through some of these verses, bring ourselves up to date, and then we'll talk about, finish up with the, with, with the subject for today. Uh, it, so here's, again, Jesus is illustrating the point of the Father. It says here in Luke 15, 11, to illustrate this point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. So the young son didn't want to wait for his dad to die. I want my inheritance now. So the father not only gave it, the young man his inheritance, the younger son, but also the older son. And so the, uh, the younger son took that. A few days later, he packed up all of his belongings, moved to a distant land where he wasted all of his money in wild living. You can just try not to let your imagination go too far, but you, want, you, you know what, what's going on here. This guy's really messed up. He's off the rails. He runs out of money, it says. Verse 14, about the time his money ran out. Have you noticed that when you're living wildly, when you have money, you have, friend, you have friends. When your money runs out, your friends run out. You ever notice that? And so that's what happened with him. A great, not only that, but a great famine swept over the land at the same time, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer, verse 15, to hire him, and the man sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go to my father and say, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So we're going to pick up uh, in the next verse here. So what we see happening and what we looked at the last couple of weekends is the first awakening that this young man experienced that we can all identify with was this desire for more, this longing for more. He wanted more in his life. He believed that that was found with him getting his inheritance and going into a distant land. And what we looked at, interestingly enough, is that the problem, have, uh, the, the issue rather, of the son wanting more and longing for more in and of itself really wasn't a problem. It wasn't a bad thing. It was how he was going to go about getting that more that got him into trouble. The same is true for us. The longing that we have to see more and experience more in our lives, our families, our marriages, our children, our careers, our finances, the desire for us to experience more in and of itself isn't bad at all. As a matter of fact, I believe it's from the Lord. We need to hunger and thirst. We should want more of God. We should want more in our marriages, right? More in our lives. And just like this young man, it's not the desire that more for more that gets us into trouble. It's how we go about trying to accomplish that. Well, this young man thought 
He was going to accomplish that in a distant land. And what we discovered is that we're not shaped for a distant land. We're not fashioned for a distant land. The answers we're looking for in our lives will never be found in a distant land. They're going to always be found at home, at the feet of our Heavenly Father. Yes, right? So we, did, we see that. We see the young man. Now he's going through all this. He's out of money. He's broke. He's starving. There's a famine. He's feeding pigs. He's so hungry he wants to eat the pig slop. And so the second thing that we saw that took place in him is regret. He experienced regret. He realized things have not planned out or turned out the way that I've planned, rather. Things aren't happening the way that I thought they were going to happen or they should have happened. So he begins to experience regret. And last week we talked about how important it is for us to embrace regret, not shame, but regret, that there's a conviction that comes over our lives. And, and that doesn't just happen when we, the, the moment or the day that we give our lives to Christ, but that sense of regret we must embrace time after time after time in our lives because that regret leads us to repentance, godly sorrow and repentance. So in the same way, so also, we just don't repent when we give our lives to Jesus if we're going to grow. And we are going to experience more of God in our lives. We all realize, right, that we're going to be repenting over and over and over and over again. Right, everybody? We're turning our hearts back to the Lord. We realize, we saw last weekend, that repentance is changing our mind, changing our direction. But it's not emotion. It's not just feeling bad. But it translates true repentance into motion, not just emotion. In other words, the, the direction of our lives change. And then God uh, gives us that time of refreshing we saw in the scriptures. But that's so important for us. And so many of you had to repent more than once this week. I had to repent this week more than once. That's a part of the growth process. That's a part of the surrendering process of, of our lives with Christ. Here's the awesome thing about being a living sacrifice the Bible talks about. Us being a living sacrifice. Well, a living sacrifice can oftentimes crawl off the altar. And you've got to put yourself back on. Every day we wake up in the morning and have to make a decision. Are we surrendering? Are, are, are we living our lives for ourselves? Or are we surrendering our lives to Christ? Right, everybody? So we face that every day. We face that uh, throughout our lives. And so this young man faced it as well. We're looking at the process here of this young man finding his way back to God. Our marriages oftentimes, though we still may be serving the Lord, we're in love with God, we love Jesus, but maybe in our marriages we've wandered off into a distant land. Maybe in some areas of our lives we found ourselves wandering off into a distant land. Maybe within our relationships with others or with our families, we found ourselves wandering off in a distant land and we need to find our way back home again. We're seeing the process of that. Not only does it begin oftentimes with this longing for more, but it also involves this regret. It's okay to embrace that. Not guilt or not shame, but regret. This didn't work. I was wrong. I was wrong. Remember the old, the, old, the old sitcom, Happy Days? I know I'm dating myself here. Remember Happy Days with Ron Howard? And, all right, there's a couple of us. Who remember. I know a lot of you don't remember. But, but Fonzie, who was one of the main characters, he could never say he was wrong. Do you remember that? He would say, I'm wrong. It, it just gets stuck right in here and right in here. That's how it is sometimes. But we've got, listen, folks, here's what the Bible tells us. There's a beautiful thing that happens when we're secure enough in God's love for us that we can say, I was wrong. I'm bad wrong. God loves me. Father, I repent. I change my mind. I surrender my life to you again. And God just wraps us in his arms and says, man, it's all right. I forg you're forgiven. You're loved. You're accepted. And then he begins to change us. It's good stuff, right? That's how, that's how that works, okay? And so we're fine. This is the process, though. So here's the other thing that this young man went through. He was the, the kind of third awakening or aha moment that was a part of him finding his way back home. Not only was it regret, but it's the, the, the third awakening, the third aha is I need help. I need help. He had dug a hole for himself so deep he knew he wasn't going to be able to dig himself out of it. 
And he's saying to himself, man, now I need help. He's experienced the regret that the heart of repentance is happening in his own life. But he realizes he cannot do this on his own. So that brings us to that portion of the parable, the story, where it says this. So he returned home to his father. That's repentance. And while he was a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. So I want to look at three things that we see in that verse, verse 20, that's taking place in the life and in the heart of the son, but also the things that are taking place in the heart of the father. And so now he realizes, man, I need to change direction. I need to start heading back in another direction. And so he's going to start making his way back home. And as he does, the first thing that we read here, it says this, while he was still a long way off. So the first point here that I want to share with you is this. Home isn't as far as you and I think it is. Because oftentimes that's what we first experience when we've gone through that, 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 that process all right, I've, I, I regret the choices and decisions I've made. I regret where I'm at. I know and our, our hearts turn back towards God in an attitude of repentance. And we know we need to head back home. And one of the first things that, that, that oftentimes the enemy, the devil, highlights for us is how far home seems to be. You know, in our cars and our rearview mirrors, uh, there's a little decal and it says, Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear, right? Well, what the enemy does in our lives, especially when he sees us changing direction, is he does just the opposite. He has that, 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 that decal, that ticker tape running across our minds, and instead of it saying objects are closer than they appear, he tries to convince us that home is further away than it really is. And I'm telling you it's a deception. Home isn't as far away as you and I think it is, or the devil tries to convince us it is. The reason why he does that is so that so we're discouraged. But what we discover is the mo- if we'll just step, if we'll take at least just two steps past the initial sense of discouragement, because here's what oftentimes we experience. We know we need to change direction. We've changed direction. We've changed our heart. we got to get back home, and it feels like where we need to be in our homes, lives, marriages, and where we are now is too far for us to get there, at least in this lifetime. And I've been there. Where where I needed to be, compared to where I was, I wasn't sure I could get there in five lifetimes. And what I discovered, like the prodigal son, is I discovered that home wasn't as far as I thought it was. It wasn't nearly as far away as the enemy was trying to convince me it was. What I discovered was there was a heavenly father who was responding immediately to my response to come home. Because one of the things we start thinking about is, is there there some kind of a bar that I need to clear to get back to the father? A bar of good works or restitution or contrition. Well, the legalist would say, yeah, there's a bar you have to clear. There's a bar you have to clear. The legalist would say that, but it's so high that you and I spend a lifetime of guilt and remorse because we can never reach it. And then there are others who set the bar so low, we lose our sense for our need for God. And we feel like we can just trust in ourselves. So what's the answer? Is there really a bar that has to be cleared? Is there a bar? Well, the answer is yes, there's a bar, but Jesus hung from it. There was a bar, but he pinned himself against it. He allowed himself to be nailed to it. There was a standard, but Jesus met it. There was a law that needed to be fulfilled, and Jesus fulfilled it for us because we couldn't. Does this make sense, everybody? And that's a beautiful thing. That's why I'm saying that home isn't as far away as we think it is. So finding our way back to God in any area of our lives or our lives in general is not about, it's not about what we did or what we do even. But it's about what Jesus has already done. See, home, because of what the sacrifice of Jesus and because of the finished work of the cross, Home isn't as far away as the devil tries to convince us it is. 
As a matter of fact, what we see, the second thing, is we see the response of the Father, which allows us to understand and clues us in at how close home really is. And I'm telling you, we, we, we've got to understand this because otherwise we get discouraged. We turn, we change directions, and it seems like, wow, I don't think I can get there from here ever, at least not in this life. I don't, how do I repair the damage? How do I make this work again? And so we get discouraged. As I said before, we get stuck. We just give up. And that's exactly what the enemy wants us to do. But I'm telling you, there's a, there's a Savior who paid the price for our sins, our failures, our mistakes, our heartaches, our disappointments. Home isn't as far away. And what we see in the reaction of the Heavenly Father tells us and reinforces that even more because what we see is the heart of the Father. That's point number two, see. Because it goes on to say in that 20th verse, the Father filled with love and compassion. The Father. So the Son, He sees where He needs to go. Okay? And home is still a far way off, a long way off. But then the verse goes on to say, but the Father, the Father filled with love and compassion. Notice it didn't say that He was filled with indignation or anger or judgment. It says that he was filled with compassion. His response to the young man's change of direction wasn't indignation. But his response, according to Jesus, was love and compassion. So as we've said at the beginning of our our study, that one of the greatest revelations that Jesus brought to mankind Jesus being God himself, fully God and fully man. But Jesus being the ultimate revelation of God. Jesus said this about himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know what God's really like? Watch me, listen to me, and you'll know exactly what God is really like. Now, why was he saying that? Because religion had given mankind a distorted and twisted view of God. Now, man understood God as a God of power, and he is. And they understood him as a God of judgment, and he is ultimately will be. And they understood him as a God of miracles, and thank God he is a God of miracles. Right, everybody? But mankind did not understand God as a heavenly father. A father. And Jesus came revealing this, bringing rather this revelation of God, not just a God of judgment, not just a God of anger, not just a God of power, not just a God of miracles, but Jesus said, I want to introduce to you an aspect of God that you've not seen before, and that's God as your heavenly Father. What is He like? Because some of you may not have healthy, good fathers. So let me describe to you, Jesus is saying, who, what that father, what your heavenly father looks like. So he tells this story of this young man who's just jacked up his life and made the dumbest decisions you could possibly make. And now he decides after everything is gone and he's completely destroyed his life, he's making his way back home. And Jesus is describing this picture of our heavenly father. And he's not filled with anger. He's not filled with judgment. He's not filled with retribution. He's filled with love and compassion. That's the God that Jesus, that's your heavenly father, he's saying. That's your heavenly father. That's what he's like. That's his attitude. That's the heart of your father. It's not like we might hear from a father here or from a mother. We mess up, we come back, and it's not like we hear the words, after all I've done for you. This is how you repay me? Oh, 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 now you want to come back home after you messed everything up and you're out of money and all your friends are gone and you're eating pigs. Oh, now you want to come back home. Well, we'll just see how that works out. In our natural minds, oftentimes that's the picture we have. Jesus wanted to make sure there was no confusion about the heart of the Father as he was speaking to a bunch of folks who had wandered away from home. 
And what he was saying is the moment you begin to move in the right direction with a true heart of remorse and repentance, here's the response you can expect from your heavenly father, that he's filled with love and compassion. It says about Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, it says when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And the Bible says he goes, he goes ahead after that and begins to do something. He begins to minister to the sick and to the broken. In Mark chapter 1, verse 41, it says Jesus was moved with compassion and he reached out and touched this leper and said, I'm willing, be healed. The reason why that's so important is because the leper came to Jesus and said, I know if you, if you can... Or if you will, or if you're willing, I know you can heal me. See, the leper didn't have any question in his mind about the ability of Jesus to remove the disease of leprosy from his body. He didn't, he didn't, he, there was no confusion there. The leper didn't doubt Jesus' ability. His doubt was in Jesus' willingness. Because leprosy, not only was it highly contagious, and that's why they were separated from everybody else when they, when they got that disease. But it was also considered to be a spiritual curse. Back the religious mindset of the day was if you had leprosy, God struck you with leprosy because of some sin in your life. So not only were they physically unclean, but they were spiritually unclean. So there was all of this stigma attached to it. So this leper breaks the law, comes back into town, finds Jesus, cries out, if you're willing, I know you can remove this leprosy. I know you're able, I'm just not sure you're willing. I don't know if you're like all the other religious leaders who have scorned me, who consider me to be cursed of God. I don't know. what they're, I'm not sure where you're at with this. But I know you're my last chance or I'm going to die. If you're will, And Jesus answered the question, I'm willing. The Bible says he was moved with compassion and said, I am willing. Aren't you, aren't you thankful? I know I am. I'm thankful God's willing. I'm thankful God's willing to change us, to touch us, to transform us, to forgive us, to heal us, even if we're the ones that brought the sickness on us, whatever that sickness is. I'm talking about the sickness of sin, the, 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 the disease of disobedience. I'm so thankful that God is that heavenly Father filled with love and compassion that's willing to reach out and that He is willing. I love that. I need that. Man, I need that. We all need that, really. Because compassion, see, compassion is different than sympathy, and it's different than pity. You can pity someone, we can sympathize with someone, and still not be involved, still be disengaged, still be distant. I feel sorry for them. I pity them. I sympathize. We can have all of those feelings and still not do anything about it. It's impossible to have compassion and remain un or disengaged. It's impossible to have compassion and remain uninvolved. See, that's why it's so important that the scriptures tell us that the Father was filled with love and compassion. And it goes on to say this, third point. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And here's the third thing that we see. Once this son begins to change directions in his life, the third thing we see is we see a God who runs. Filled with compassion, he ran to the sun. He didn't wait for the sun to crawl over broken glass. He didn't wait for the sun to claw his way back. He didn't wait for the sun to go all. He didn't. That's why I said at the very beginning, home isn't as far away as you think. As you, as the devil tries to convince us it is. Our Heavenly Father, finding our way back to God in any area of our lives, folks, we have a Heavenly Father that's filled with love and compassion. Home isn't nearly as far away as you and I think that it is. The moment He sees our head pop up over the horizon, the moment we change direction, He doesn't wait for us to crawl all the way back home. He's a Father that's filled with love and compassion, and He's a God who runs. We serve a God who runs. Now, Important men don't run, typically. None of the presidents of the United States, you've never seen them run to greet anybody. You don't see a CEO run to greet anybody, man. No, they walk, saunter, maybe even swagger a little bit. But they don't run. But that isn't the case with this father. 
who's a wealthy landowner who could have just sat on the porch and waited for his son to come home to see how serious he really was. That's not what this father did, and that's not our heavenly father. If anybody has a right to not run, it would be God. But that's not the kind of... We serve a God who runs. Listen, when we do the same stupid stuff over and over again, and we find the distance between our head and our heart increasing, it's comforting for us to know that we serve a God who runs towards us. We can be running towards God. But no matter how fast we're running towards God, I want you to know He's running towards us even faster. And here's what happens. When He finally reaches His Son, He's not thinking about how He smells like pig slop, like pigs. He's not thinking about what He's done. There's no, as I said before, there's no lectures. There's just embracing and tears and hugging and kissing and a celebration. That, by the way, irritated the older brother. We'll talk about that next week. Because every one of us will have older brothers in our lives. Can I jump ahead? Kind of say something real quick about the older brother? I'm kind of stealing a little bit from next week. Is that all right? It doesn't matter. I'm going to do it anyway. I know it's a rhetorical question. It's very unfair for me to say that. But the older brother, so I apologize. The older, older brother, he didn't care whether the younger son came home. That didn't bother him. That wouldn't have bothered him. He didn't care if the son came home. He didn't even care if the son came home and sat at the same dinner table as he had before. What the older brother didn't like is the son came home and the father treated him as a son with all the rights and privileges as a son that the older brother enjoyed. That's what the older bro brother didn't like. And we're all going to have older brothers in our lives. We mess up, God forgives us, restores us, and there's always going to be folks looking at like that, whoa, 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 I don't, that, what really bothers me is you're getting the same benefit that I'm getting, and I never went off into a distant land. Well, no, not physically you didn't, but, but in your heart you did. In fact, the religious leaders, Jesus healed the, the lame man on a Sabbath, told him to pick up his mat and walk. I'd been lame for 38 years. He picks up his mat, and he's walking, and it's on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders look at him and go, what are you doing carrying your mat? As opposed to saying, wow, you're healed. This is amazing. Tell us how it happened. That's not what they said. You know what they were really telling that man? Get back on your mat. You're always going to have folks telling you to get back on your mat. Don't do it. We serve a heavenly father who runs, who restores, who redeems. We can find our way back home. We can find our way back to God. Right, everybody? Does this make sense? The moment he sees us, he starts running towards us. Let me close with this. This happened in 1992, Barcelona Olympics. An English runner by the name of Derek Redman. He was actually, they expected him to win, but what, what took place caused him to be the most famous Olympic race and the most famous Olympian to ever finish last. So in 1992, while he's running the 400 meter dash, he tears a hamstring muscle. Initially, he collapses, he gets back up, and he starts limping his way. He starts limping his way. You guys got that? He starts limping his way back to, uh, to, to try to cross the finish line. As he's doing that, you see his dad running out there. His dad goes past the security, they're telling him he can't do it. He grabs a hold of his boy. And he's going to walk his boy back across the finish line so he doesn't have to do it by himself. He sees the pain, the anguish, the heartache, the, all that this man worked for, it all went away in a few shameful and embarrassing moments. And in that time, you see Derek's dad walking him back. Here's what I'm trying to say. You and I have a father who will run to be with us in the middle of our greatest failure, our deepest pain, while our biggest disappointments and greatest hurts, and we're humiliated in tears. He comes alongside of us because that's what a father does. And we serve a heavenly father. we could bow our heads, close our eyes. I'm going to ask our prayer teams if they would to make their way to the front after we dismiss this morning. If you want prayer in addition to what we pray now or anything at all, these folks are here. 
to pray for you and with you. Father, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, there may be some of us here, regardless of the level of commitment we have to you, where we're at in our spiritual lives and our journey, there may be our whole lives we may have found ourselves in a distant land. We may have been broken and torn and hurt, but unlike Derek Redmond, it's not just a physical injury that has crippled us, but it's our own sin and our own failure that has crippled us. And if that's you this morning, I'm just telling you again, open up your heart and allow your heavenly Father to come alongside of you. That's who He is. Jesus said it Himself. Jesus, the truth and the life, said that as soon as the Father saw the Son, He ran to Him and kissed Him and embraced Him and celebrated His return home. I'm asking that you would just open your heart up to that. Allow your Heavenly Father to do just that. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Mike, that's me. I've been crippled. I've been wounded. I've been... And I need. I'm coming back home. I want to come back home. But I need to to surrender my life to Him. If that's you, slip your hand up high enough and long enough for me to see that. I'm going to pray with you right where you're at. Now's your time. This is your opportunity. This is for you. Father, you see these hands and you see these lives. And we lean in on your compassion. We thank you for changing us. You don't leave us where we're at. You don't leave us where we're at, but it's so good that you meet us where we're at and you take us where we need to go by your grace and your power and your love. Father, we surrender ourselves to that this day. We receive your forgiveness, your grace, your strength. Keep home clearly in our path. Thank you, God, for taking us back to the place where we belong, that we've been shaped for and fashioned for. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, can we thank God for his word?